Alright. Okay, um, I want to I want to uh, talk about a uh, new multiplexing technique that I've uh, developed and have done some simulation work on, and uh, I'll try to explain it to the best of my ability. And uh, if you have any questions about it, uh, feel free. And if you have questions in the midst of the talk, that that would be fine as well. I suspect I have about 15 minutes. I don't know if that is all right. So. Um, Someone can, out like there can keep me. <laughs> yeah, so some chairing the job me to chair the session. I can talk as long as I want to. Uh, I'll keep that up. Okay, well, this is the outline. I'll talk about uh, chaotic properties and um, try to explain a little bit, give you a little bit of uh, historical perspective about it. I'll talk about a specific uh, oscillator that's, that's used in this process, uh, then how they all are kind of combined together. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about orthogonality, the, the process itself, uh, describe the system, show some results, and that then we'll be done. Uh, conclusions and future work. Um, so first of all, uh, how many of you are familiar with chaos or chaos theory, nonlinear dynamics? Okay, so um, first of all, what, what this has to do with is about, um, we, we're used to uh, waveforms and signals that are periodic, like sinusoids and things like that. They repeat. We know what they're going to do from time equal t0 to infinity, essentially, mathematically at least. Um, and so we use that a lot. We use that because it's easy to work with, and we can solve the mathematics and all that. Uh, Nonlinearity brings new things into the process, and um, a subset of nonlinear uh, dynamics is chaotic processes, where chaos kind of lives between periodic and randomness. So it's not purely random, not purely uh, periodic or predictable. It's somewhere in between. Um, so it kind of started with this uh, researcher, uh, uh, Poincaré, and he was studying celestial bodies. And, and as you get uh, what's sometimes called the three-body problems, where you have multiple gravitational uh, interactions, you can get these chaotic properties that occur. He studied that there. Uh, much further along, um, in the 1990s or so, this Professor Jim York pretty much was credited with coining the name chaos to this type of behavior. And this group in Maryland is a, uh, a well-known international research group that has been studying uh, chaotic dynamics for many, many years. Uh, I, I worked with them as well, so uh, they, I know a lot of the things that they've done. Um, chaos is more better defined by its properties more so than any set definition. I've called it bounded instability. I've, called it, I've tried to describe it as living between uh, uh, deterministic and uh, randomness but that's still not a, a, a strict definition. Um, but it's been observed in, in a number of uh, systems, mathematical equations, chemical reactions, fluid dynamics, electrical circuits, et cetera, et cetera. You've seen this type of behavior. The common factor there is nonlinearity. And so um, one of the interesting, and I have a... Um, uh, reference to this paper in this, but it was used to uh, optimize spacecraft for fuel efficiency. One example was uh, there was a probe that was sitting at a Lagrange point, and they wanted to send it to meet a comet, to kind of send this probe to be the first probe that actually intersected a comet. It didn't have enough fuel for it to just, you know, um, send it on a normal trajectory. So they used this, um, the, the chaotic orbits between the Earth, the Moon, and this probe, and uh, calculated these wild trajectories, but were able to determine where the, it would intersect with the comet. And they began to give it these small nudges to get it in this chaotic orbit, and eventually steered it right to the comet. And this was the first um, uh, intersection of a, of a, of a uh, probe with a comet. 
Um, one of the one of the places uh, that was interesting also was a uh, guy named Edward, Edward Lorenz, was a meteorologist, was set out to try to predict the weather and use mathematical equations. He he used the um, uh, uh, Navier-Stokes equations, fluid dynamics, to try to come up with a set. He came up with this set of equations and began to calculate. So he, this was a time you, you calculated essentially by hand. Um, so he's calculating and plotting, and he stops for the day, goes home, comes back, starts again. He started a little bit behind where he stopped to try to make sure he was doing the right thing, uh, but he made a slight error. In, in, in a few decimal places. And he began to see that the trajectories diverged. And so this, he didn't understand why this happened, and this was one of the first um, mathematical observations of chaotic processes. So, um, and, and the Lorenz equations and the butterfly effect and all that is a, is, is a part of all of it. Now, here's one, a simple chaotic map. It's called the logistic map. This is the equation of, uh, is an iterative process uh, governed by that equation. Uh, I call this R, but it's actually uh, rho. Uh, and when rho is equal to about 3.5 or so, it, it starts behaving chaotically. Here's where rho is 1, 2, 3. Just above, up, up here, is where the, the system starts to behave chaotically. You can see this a little more clearly in, in what's called a bifurcation diagram. Um, this is a single point, then it begins to bounce between two points, and then four points, and then you get this period doubling root, and right around three, so then three fives or so, it start, you start to get this, and the points wander all over the map. So in these areas, these regions, this is considered uh, uh, chaotic behavior, because it loses predictability over, over amount of time. Here's another illustration of that. You start off three points relatively close to each other, uh, right here. Then after 10 iterations of the map, this is where they end up. This is not uh, typical of a linear system. A linear system, the space it has here will be mirrored no matter how far away you, um, you iterate. So this, it, you can actually measure the spreading of this by what's called a Lyapunov exponent. And uh, if it's positive, then it's considered to be uh, chaotic. All right, so here's an example in an electrical circuit called the Colpit oscillator. Uh, these, this is the circuit diagram. There's the equations of motion. Um, and this is the nonlinear portion that's kind of essentially housed within the transistor. The rest of these are lumped, typical lumped element circuits uh, driven by two sources, um, and, and those are the equations there. So it's a three-dimensional set of, uh, of equations. So now if I plotted the solutions of this inductor current, uh, this voltage across the emitter, and the voltage across the collector, which are all the independent uh, variables there, if I plotted them, the solutions versus each other, at a particular set of values for those inductors, resistors, and all that, you can get this kind of behavior. Now, typically, this is a sinusoidal oscillator. So it, just, it was built and designed to produce sinusoidal oscillations for carriers, signals, and things like that. But this is clearly not. And uh, while it wanders around this whole structure, it does stay contained within this structure, therefore call this bounded instability. Um, now, so you can kind of see also uh, what I described in that map a minute ago is also evident here in this. Uh, you have to the starting port right there, and uh, you move around over time, the points uh, diverge. Now, there is some compression in the map, too, but there's expansion and compression at the same time, and therefore it, it, um, it remains bounded, okay? Now, this is all just a background. Here's the solutions in time. Here's the conductor current, that voltage across the emitter, voltage across the collector in time. One of the things I wanted to point out here is the diversity of the wave shapes that are here. And this is important for what I want to do. 
Um, so as you see, if you could slide a window through here, you can get a bunch of different shapes just by doing that. And if I want a shape that looks like this, I say I want this in, uh, voltage here, I want to start at this time, and I want it to last for this long, and I can get that. Or I can get this, or I can get that, or anything else in between here. But that's just for this one. Now, um, one of the things I did was I wanted to create a set of waveforms that had a lot of diversity to them. So I would take an oscillator like this one, uh, and so that, that particular oscillator might be C0, oscillation. So, for example, this, this one might be C0, and this C1 and C2. And then there are many other mathematical expressions that create these chaotic behavior. So um, I can use them all. And I created a set of waveforms that were made up of combinations of all of them. And I ended up with 32 of them. Now, don't ask me why 32 ended up being the optimal amount, but it did. And I started doing this to, to do some compression work. Um, but as I began to see uh, there was all this diversity there, and then I wanted to see if I could find orthogonal sets of waveforms. Now, with orthogonality, um, you, you, you probably realize that, for example, sine and cosine are orthogonal to each other. And if you take any two sets of waveforms and uh, integrate them, uh, the multiple of them together over time, if they're equal to zero, then if they are orthogonal to each other. Um, so in this case, we, we're, we're kind of creating these uh, orthogonal sets, and uh, so this, this function, g, is this integration, uh, and, and m and q is uh, just the indice of the actual waveform. So you can create this waveform, this, this matrix of values for however many sets you have. Um, and ideally, if, there, if you have an orthogonal set of waveforms, this would be an uh, identity type matrix. Uh, in the case of of, that I have, uh, I, I found three that were mutually orthogonal to each other. Now, and, and that's just to make them uh, orthonormal. Um, now, so from these triplets, and I'll show you, show you three of them, um, you can now uh, encode them with the, these uh, pieces of data. Uh, and, and then, in order to um, get, it, get them back. So, so first of all, the waveforms are not truly orthogonal, they're pseudo-orthogonal, meaning that those integrals those cr on the cross terms are not specifically zero, but they're very small compared to the ones on the diagonal. Um, so you can separate, you can, uh, uh, separate them out and still get back the coefficients, which basically uh, encode the data. So here are three uh, sets that are orthogonal over this period of time. And the important thing that I wanted was that the only significant term, that the first, um, th this is the magnitude of the 4A series of this waveform here. And I wanted to make sure that any term beyond the first one was, was insignificant to the first one, so that the frequency components in there were, was not very high. Um, and so these are, the, these are three, or one set of, of triplets that I came up with. Um, and so they're combined in this way. Typical, uh, there's the, um, the coefficients all multiplied with the... Uh, triplets and added together, and that creates a waveform on that end. Uh, on the demux side, you take that, you do the uh, integration. Here's where you subtract out uh, any of the error terms, and then you, um, then you get your final uh, coefficients back. So now, to actually uh, encode this, 
if I take a, a coefficient and I allow um, k bits, in this case this is k equal 4, 4 bits of information for each, um, each coefficient, this is what the um, um, uh, diagram will look like, it's a, the, the constellation will look like, and actually there's three of them. There's one for each triplet set, because the end phase and quadrature is encoded on, on each one. So actually this is, this is k equals 2, because there's two bits on this one and two bits on that. So, um, so here's what a constellation for k equals 2 would look like, and there would be three of them. Uh, and this is the spec power spectral density uh, at the baseband for uh, this encoding. And this is in comparison to a, uh, a QAM. Now, if you look at this, um, you actually get more, the, the spectral uh, efficiency is actually tighter than uh, QAM. And so you can get more, and it stands up better to noise. And that's, that's the, key, um, the key that makes this uh, a, a, a better process. So here's a uh, transmitter system. Uh, so you have the um, uh, um, data that's, that's multiplexed. This is the MOC multiplexer, turns it into the baseband waveform that's multiplied on the in-phase and quadrature carriers and, and, and sends out. So that's the uh, transmit side. Now, here's what the constellation for it's derived from a simulation looks like. As you can see, here's the three of them uh, with all the data essentially um, associated with it. Here's the receiver side, um, you know, typical stuff, low pass filter, as you just mentioned. Um, and then so you debunk, get the data back, and do the comparison. Now, here's on the receiver side, I added, in this case, I added some uh, 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 additive Gaussian white noise to it uh, at an EB over N0, in this case was a minus 10 dB, and this is for K equals 2. So you can see the spreading that occurs because of the noise, but the, the data is clearly uh, delineated uh, for these different, these different um, examples. So here's a simulation result for the bit error ratio. Um, and as you can see, um, it performs very well in noise. Um, and here's k equals 2 is essentially equivalent to 16 QAM in, in, in our comparison cases. Uh, and, and these uh, actually go out much further. This one is is comparable to 64 QAM, um, and this one is comparable to um, uh, 128 QAM, I'm sorry, 256 QAM. Okay, so um, let me just conclude by saying uh, we've, we've, we've developed this new uh, multiplexing slash modulation technique, um, and so these pseudo-orthogonal oscillations um, work pretty well if you cancel out the, um, the errors that are there. Um, triplets have been created and they're based on uh, these, these chaotic uh, basis functions. Now one, one thing that I, I do have, I didn't mention here, is that I've created, uh, there are multiple sets of these orthogonal waveforms and you actually can can distinguish between the sets. So there's even a higher uh, encoding efficiency that's available by doing that. I've started that work and doing some simulations. Uh, we have a tighter bandwidth, so there's more efficiency based uh, compared to QAM, and there's better noise uh, performance uh, for a comparable data rate. Um, which means, and, and we're looking at Wi-Fi or, or 802.11G as a potential application, um, and so, um, you know, your, your data rate goes down when you, when you have to continue to resend or implement a lot of error correction, so if you, are, if you perform better in noise, you don't have to keep resending packets, and so you get, you get that true throughput goes higher. 
Uh, so that's, that's where we're seeing a benefit. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there's improved noise performance uh, compared to um, QAN. Some of, the, some of the later work, next work, we're going to implement this algorithm and simulate. Uh, we, we're already designed some hardware to, to do this uh, baseband uh, transceiver. Um, so we, this is what I mentioned, this enhanced set where we use multiple sets of these uh, triplets. And my overall goal for uh, the research, I have a number of... Um, of, of other um, implementations of, of chaotic processes to um, data communication, and there are benefits derived in each one. It's like on a compression, I have a, a improved compression, I have improved bandwidth and data efficiency, also I have improved um, 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 power efficiency, and I want to look at how this all affects in its model for sustainability and if the environmental impact, if you have all those improvements, because uh, these things are connected to battery life, to, to uh, use, uh, using batteries, um, um, uh, what goes into the waste cycle, all this stuff. So I want to see the impact of improved efficiency in those three areas on the global um, uh, sustainability. And so, as you have a lot of emerging societies that are using a lot of wireless mobile devices, batteries, all these things are going into uh, uh, recycling and, and into waste, and we want to see how much improving efficiency reduces it. So, that's kind of what I'm looking at as a big picture of uh, all of this. Okay? Um, and then finally here I have you know, some of the references that I mentioned, and there's a lot of interesting reading and, and all of that. Okay, uh, that's all I got. Uh, any questions, comments? Yes. Yeah, so, um, um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, it's obviously very interesting, as you know, you seem to get great efficiency improvements there. What, um, if any, barriers to implementation? Uh, barriers are um, some of the uh, errors that occur uh, and canceling out some of those errors. Um, we've implemented it in hardware already, and it's working as we've simulated it. So in that regard, I, I think more so it's just an adoption thing. Um, you know, it's like I mentioned talking about going into 802.11G. Those, those, you know, there's, there's the standards and establishments. So we have to find areas that are, that are, are, are not so like the, you know, more the free free uh, frequencies that we can show that there's market improvement and then start to, to go there. So I, I think that's the biggest barrier is adoption more. Are you working with Maryland at all or with any other? Oh yes, I, I, I worked with Maryland. I, I did my undergraduate work in Maryland and you know I, I worked there uh, as I was coming through and a lot of my research and my dissertation was in this area of work and I worked with them even though I was at Johns Hopkins, I worked in Wharton, Maryland a lot to, to, to do so. I know Jim York and Celso Grabozzi and um, um, Ed Ott and also like this guy I worked with, and he was their student, and um, you know, so yeah. You know. Okay. So thank you. I hope I didn't Thanks, go over two, two, two. Just let you know, Chance, your, your paper or your, your paper, I wonder that paper in the oh. conference. Oh, oh, it won, it won the... It okay, round it around the quarter past five. Oh. Or if you're not, then like, I you've got I'm going to come back from something, I might. Like, really? Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's nice to know. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.